to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So Colin, like you discussed last week, and we promised our audience, we are going to bring you another episode with the fine gentleman from Half A One H, which Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins and Major Nardelli. This week, we're going to discuss the Airman Leadership Qualities, the ALQs. Now, quick background, Colin, Half A1 actually reached out to you and I back a few months ago mm -hmm. to get our opinion and our feedback on these ALQs. They gave us a little inside baseball that, hey, these are going to be important. This is, you know, forming the basis of our evaluation system. What do you guys think? Get it out there in the world. And we did that, enjoyed those episodes. A lot of really good thought, I thought, you know, went into that. And now they followed up. They wanted to give us feedback and allow us to, you know, continue to work through this because as we'll discuss, Colin, they know that they don't have this 100% right mm -hmm. and feedback is the only way we're going to get better. And this matters, which is, I think, what the basis of this conversation will really point out. And I'm looking forward to bringing this really important conversation to the folks that listen to this podcast. Yeah, these ALQs, they're not going away. They may not look exactly like what they do right now. And we'll get into how that transformation, how things can change in the interview and then in our commentary. But this idea of having a more concrete way of knowing what it is that we value and how to measure it is not going away. And so we have to get this right. Now, is it going to be 100% right? No, because it can't be. We can't appease every single person that listens to this podcast or that happens to join the Air Force or wear their uniform it for some amount of time. But we can try really hard. And this is our effort. This is their effort in order to move things in that right direction. So once again, welcome to Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins, Major Nardelli. So grateful to have them both on the show. We'll turn the interview over to them. All right, Jim, Josh, thank you so much for coming back for another episode. Appreciate the knowledge and experience that you shared with us last week about the 38 Foxtrot career field. But today we want to get more in depth about that impact that the force support officer can have, as well as that focus that you all have on the recruiting, the retention, the development of the Air Force officer, most specifically these airman leadership qualities that were released back in, I believe it was in February of this year, 10 airman leadership qualities. And Reed and I covered them in depth in one of our episodes. That's episode 76, where we talked about what an Air Force officer should be. Reed and I gave our assessment of those ALQs at the time. And, you know, since we put that episode out, we have been in contact, Jim and I, you know, we've shared some emails, some conversations back and forth, and the opportunity presented itself for you to come onto the show and share your perspective from half A1, because that's where you both were working on these ALQs and putting out that policy, that strategic vision for the Air Force, and wanted to absolutely give you the space, the platform to where you could share your experience, your perspective, your reasoning for putting these things out there to the Air Force and have a little bit more conversation about it. So Jim, let's start with you. Since as I understand it, you were one of the originators of the ALQs. This is your brainchild. So where did it come from and what sort of need, what sort of problem were you trying to solve for the Air Force by generating and putting out these ALQs? Thank you, Colin. First of all, I have to say that I wish that these were my brainchild. As we were kind of talking on the last episode, right, about that force-wide impact, 
the one thing is is that usually at the air staff level it takes longer yeah. right because you have that force wide impact you have to be a little bit more deliberate even as we work to accelerate change some of these projects just take a very sure. long time so i will say to give credit where it's due my predecessor on the project was a major kevin slaughter i've met kevin he's fantastic dude yes yes imagine trying to replace him yeah sorry mm. yep <laughs> yeah <Couldn't> do it <laughs> so uh, he was part of and it was also a, a whole of team effort that the talent management innovation cell as a team within the a1 a1h is the office abbreviation they as a team developed these and okay. to your question of what's the problem that we're trying to solve it's really not necessarily a problem that we're trying to solve, but we're trying to make sure that we have a means to articulate what the Air Force values and performance and the characteristics that we want to define and incentivize and measure our airmen's performance. And that especially when you look at some of the aspects when we're working on how we evaluate performance, how we give feedback on performance, especially on our officer side, which is, I know, our core audience here. So to the group, all the ALQs do apply are being used for feedback by our enlisted and officers. Our conversation today will probably be geared towards specifically yeah. officers. As you all know, in our evaluation system, it's meets does not meets. And we have these six or seven performance factors that no one really looks at unless we're thinking of saying someone did not meet standards. Yeah. Right. We try to give tailored feedback to it, but it really just it wasn't clicking. And we were hearing from the service, from the officer corps, hey, we need more. We want more. And then additionally, from the Air Force enterprise wide level, we were looking at how are we making these talent management decisions? Mm -hmm. What more information can we bring to those decision cycles as we move places and make sure that we're putting the best person in the best position at the best time or the right person, right place, right time? Right. And so that's kind of what we're using the ALQs or that was the reasoning behind their development or part of that rationale. Yeah, it makes sense to me. My experience coming into Air Force ROTC being an instructor was, hey, my responsibility is to develop people to become an officer. But there wasn't anything like that I could concretely say, this is what it means to be an officer, which is, you know, obviously one of the themes that we carry over across this entire podcast. And so like, I knew in my heart of hearts what right looked like, right? I knew what the good officer was capable of, the type of performance that they would exhibit, way that they would communicate and carry themselves. I had seen it before. I knew what I was supposed to produce in that respect, but I couldn't point anybody to it. I couldn't say, Cadet Snuffy, these are the things that you are being measured on. And if you don't meet these standards, you will not receive a commission. But here's the thing. My top five cadets, super easy to identify, right? Everybody knows who their top five is. Everybody also knows who their bottom five are. Those people are really easy to identify. It was that fuzzy middle that was always elusive. And when they would come to me for feedback, I would be at a loss because I couldn't say, okay, this is where you are falling short because I didn't have the standard. I didn't have something concrete. I didn't have a rubric or anything that I could measure them off of. And if I couldn't measure cadets, well, that was also true for my own performance. How could I measure my growth, my development, my level of performance and say, this is where I'm falling short. This is where I'm doing well. So the feedback for myself was not as good as it could have been. And then you just extrapolate that across the entire Air Force. And it makes total sense to me why Kevin Slaughter, why you, Jim, were you know, involved in this effort of producing something that we could then point to or to say, these are the things that the Air Force values in its officers and beginning that process of learning how to produce it, how to replicate it, how to recruit it, how to incentivize it, as you said, and have that be the thing that we become over the course of time. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I'll say, you actually hit on the two kind of major players in an evaluation system, or even a performance feedback system, the rater or supervisor and the rate T or the airman, yeah. right? The one who's receiving the feedback or receiving the evaluation. And so one of the things through these rubrics is, is for those raters, whether they're an experienced rater or an inexperienced rater, but what our findings and our research have found is, especially for our younger raiders, is that putting these ALQs in the form of a rubric, right, that allows them to point on a piece of paper to the sentence that makes the most sense, 
right? Another way to think of it is, is we are giving you the answer to the test and it is an open book test. Yeah. And we're going to point and say, see this sentence, see how this applies to your actions as a rate T. This is how you're communicating. This is where I, I'm rating your emotional intelligence or your efforts in executing the mission or your job proficiency that we can point to it. And then even better, we can point further down on the rubric and go, and this is how you can get better. Yeah. So that even if that's not a strength for you, you can still use that rubric as the rater to help guide and facilitate that conversation and point your rate T, the fuzzy middle as you will, help them find a way to improve. And same thing for those officers for your top five, I would be hard pressed to find that in any one of those five that they're excelling in all 10 AOQs. You mean they're not firewall fives? They're not right. just on the right column for everything that they do. They're not just, you know, God's <laughs> gift to the Air Force. Exactly. You're hitting on another issue, right? <laughs> but that if the rater and rate T, especially the rater is being honest with their assessment and the rate T is open to hearing that honesty, right? If they're comfortable with uncomfortable conversations, it allows those top performers to continue to get feedback so that they can sustain that superior performance and grow as well. Because oftentimes those top performers, the feedback's like, you're doing great. Just work on the margins, right? I know it when I see it and what you're doing makes sense to me. So just keep doing it mm -hmm. instead of like, hey, you're great. Like my last supervisor sat me down and you know, it was like, hey, you're a good communicator. It's one of your strengths, but X, Y, Z. And she gave me yeah. solid feedback on how to become an even better communicator, which is something that I need to continue to do as I continue in my career. And likewise, it really makes those uncomfortable conversations of like, you are not the best at this, right? Yeah. Even think of the way I brought that up, like in the Air Force, that made me feel uncomfortable, right? Because of our system, it's hard to have those uncomfortable conversations. But like, this is not a strength of yours. You're developing here. But here we have a roadmap. Yeah. And likewise, to the rate T's, it's the same thing. Here's the roadmap. Here's where even if your raiders may be a little confused, but it's like, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is where I put you. And I'm not sure the best advice to help you improve. The rate T themselves can overcome that and look at that and go, okay, it's the behavioral anchored rating system. The scientists will tell you it's called. And they yeah. can look at that and go, okay, that's the behavior I have to demonstrate. That's the type of leader I need to be to be marked higher against that ALQ. Yeah, absolutely. That there is my favorite thing about the ALQs is the existence of a rubric. Now. I may have some disagreements about the actual ALQs themselves or the actual like verbiage that is used inside of the rubric, but the fact that there is a rubric, that there is now a standard that we can all measure ourselves off of makes things so much better. And as an institution, you hit on this, we are not good at feedback. We eschew those tough conversations for whatever reason. I mean, I thought we were Air Force officers that were trained up to embrace conflict and, you know, we do war, like that's our business. But for whatever reason, we struggle to have those tough conversations with people and to provide meaningful feedback. And here, these rubrics, the ALQs with these rubrics, it lowers the barrier to entry to meaningful feedback. So that is one of the reasons why I really like the AOQs and what you have presented to us. So Jim, you've given us here the senior CGO, junior FGO look, but Josh, let's turn over to you to give your perspective, especially since you've been working around senior leaders, you were with the Colonel's group doing assignments, you've been around the Air Force for an even longer time than both of us. Yeah, careful there. <laughs> let's get your perspective on you know, same question. What was the issue from the higher level perspective that maybe senior leaders were identifying or that you saw among senior leaders that these ALQs are going to help us get after? Yeah, thanks, Colin. And yeah, and thanks for not throwing out there that old word. I would never, <laughs> yeah. never, never. I think that, you know, while it's true, yeah, I might be representing a little bit of a more tenured perspective. Good word. Down our group here. Seasoned. Seasoned, exactly. Yeah. What I will say is, you know, I'm old enough to remember the performance feedback worksheet, which had no rubrics, right? It had no anchored, you know, feedback. It was a great tool for telling me where I existed on the spectrum of my particular supervisors. And so those who are more tenured and seasoned like me will remember that PFW that we used to get. You were told to fill it out in pencil so that you could change based off of the conversation that you had with your Ray T. And we transitioned to 
you know, another form of performance feedback, and then we transition to the Airman Comprehensive Assessment. And so moving to the Airman Leadership Qualities, in some regards, like I think we all equip across our career, you know, what's old is new again, and the only thing that stays the same is change, right? And I look at it not so much tongue-in-cheek, but more for the fact that I believe from what I listen to our senior leaders who set this in motion, you know, starting at the chief of staff at the Air Force level, is we were working to modernize and we are working to modernize our talent management programs. And feedback and evaluations are critical components of human capital systems that do talent management. Yeah. In the military, we usually call those personnel programs, but truly what they are is about how you manage the talent that the institution has. So to me, I think that's the biggest reason, you know, why change? Well, because we identified that we need to modernize how we're doing our talent management, both feedback, which I love the point you said, Colin, that we just need to recognize that as we've changed as a force, as the demographics of our force have changed and the experiences that those people, that the airmen come into the force with change, we need a, a slightly different tool to help prompt that feedback discussion and that our legacy form and our legacy paper wasn't really giving us the feedback experience that we wanted our airmen to have. And frankly, it wasn't giving us the feedback from a comparative standpoint of what performance looked like because yeah. that turned into what the evaluations look like. And then, you know, and we weren't able to do the best at comparing people across the institution. So to me, that is from the senior leader perspective, certainly what I know was presented to us and, and discussed whether it was through messaging or through base visits or down the command echelons, you know, for me, sitting as a squadron commander, listening to my wing commander, explain the changes that were on the horizon, my group commander. What I will say, again, you know, taking it from the same perspective that both of you did, just as, you know, we have our experiences as both ratees and raiders, right? Mm -hmm. and so my experience as a ratee is I certainly value the characteristics focus of the airman leadership qualities because one, and I know I'm sort of like geeking out, but this is where industry is headed. This is where industry frankly has been, and this is where yeah. industry is headed and is really looking at skills requirement and giving you feedback on, do you have the skills necessary to you know, be successful in whatever roles we're putting you in in our organization? And so for us, you know, in the Air Force, and then developing those skills, right? And that's really the great thing that I look at for me as a squadron commander and, and even in previous roles, there's no question, but for sure something that was near and dear to my heart as a squadron commander, when you look at the opportunities that you have and the responsibilities you have as a commander to affect your airmen is developing. And so if we're not getting good feedback, we're really kind of, you know, shooting in the dark at development. We're going to be, you know, lucky at best if we get that and haphazard or bad at it at worst. And so that kind of piques my interest in it just as an airman, right? If you forget the fact that I'm a force support officer and I'm on the A1H team. When I look at that and I think about the improvements it's going to open the door for, for our airmen and guardians who are using this and getting feedback based this way and then getting their evaluations and their performance, you know, which we think of as our OPRs and our EPRs, like Jim said, you know, we're focusing on the officer side, but your performance evaluation really should be tightly nested to your feedback, how you were getting that feedback. And so now to get like a rubric based feedback is really where we need to be headed. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So let's get to talking a little bit more about the ALQs themselves. So there are 10 of them and they fall under four main categories that anybody who has been a squadron commander will know what those categories are, or anybody who is masochistic and just likes to read <laughs> AFIs for fun, they will know that they come from AFI 1-2, the commander's responsibilities, right? So we've got the execution of the mission, leading airmen, managing resources, and improving the unit. Those are the four main categories. What are the 10 ALQs that fall into those four categories? Over to you, Jim. From AFI 1-2, right, it's the four major graded areas. For the ALQs, we're actually calling them the major performance areas. Okay. And so under executing the mission, you've got job proficiency, initiative, and adaptability. Okay. Under leading people, we've got inclusion and teamwork, emotional intelligence, 
and communication. Under managing resources, we've got stewardship and accountability. And under improving the unit, we have decision-making and innovation. Okay. So those are our 10 ALQs. Why those 10? Why do we care about those things? What was the process that you all went through, the, the back and forth, the paper airplanes, the dartboards on the wall? Why those 10? So why those 10? We have to kind of go back over now. I think it's an over three-year process okay. of how these have been developed. And it started by looking at our sister services, looking at industry, looking at what Fortune 500 companies were doing, and kind of looking at, okay, we've been challenged to find the qualities that define performance. And so the list started larger. And then through that process, it was narrowed down to a smaller number. That and a smaller number was then taken out for our first round of focus groups back in, I believe it was 2019. And we went to several locations throughout the Air Force, including deliberately to a guard-only location and a reserve-only location, as well as some total force focus groups. And these are made up of officer enlisted and civilians. Okay. Of when we're talking about performance, what do these mean to you? And they honed in on those definitions and they honed in on down on the list. We then stopped those focus groups, kept developing, kept working. And we started up around two, phase two of the focus groups. And in those situations, that was geared more towards officers specifically. And by more of towards, I mean solely to officers. But again, we use that total force focus. And one thing about me is I'm the son of a reservist. Okay. So for me, making sure that like that's total force, I did not want to hear about it from dad when I'm home <laughs> on Christmas. You know, you forgot, you know, the arc. And so it was very important to our entire team that we had that total force presence in the room because there are differences between them. As we are one team, one sure. fight but there are nuances to the three components of the total force. Absolutely. And so this is where, again, we were kind of looking at validating, is the rubric the best way to measure? And we looked at several different methods to evaluate and provide feedback against these ALQs and settled in on that the BARS method, the rubric method was the best method available, especially for young raiders. And that's an important, important aspect because that is the group that, I don't want to say needs the most help, but making sure it works for them is very important, right? Because they're the ones who have the least experience, and yet oftentimes they're in charge of some of our youngest officers yeah, and the most impressionable officers. And honestly, if you want the Air Force to adopt these ALQs, if you want to see these be carried into the future and become part of our identity, that's the core group that you need to get to use them. Yes. Those seasoned folks like the, you know, the Colonel Hawkins of the Air Force. Hey, I'm still here. I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> they're not going to be in the Air Force for that much longer. I'm not saying, hey, let's get Colonel Hawkins out of the Air Force right now. But the reality is that they're, you have a much shorter timeline to your career than someone who just graduated and received their commission. They're going to be around for a lot longer. They're going to have far more opportunity to be exposed and to use these ALQs. And so if you want adoption to take place, if you want these ALQs to actually become a thing in the Air Force, your junior CGOs, your junior NCOs are the ones who are going to have to take that on. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head with that. And that's why when we were reviewing this and looking at multiple methods, with the seasoned Raiders, it didn't matter what method we put in front of them. It was all accurate because they were able to just kind of go, yep, this is, and they would pinpoint on the scale and it would line up. But for our younger Raiders, and especially as we looked at certain methodology, you know, the Likert scale was one of the ones that we looked at, mm -hmm. you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And for a young Raider to say, I strongly disagree that you have the leadership quality of accountability. We talk about uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. That's really tough. Whereas just saying, being able to say, you're developing mm -hmm. in your ability to be accountable. And here's the roadmap to success going forward. So that played heavily into the considerations when we were looking at this. Sure. Another interesting uh, point about the phase two focus groups is that we had gone to two bases and then a little thing called COVID-19 happened. I don't know if you heard about it. <laughs> and we switched to an all Zoom format, just like how we're talking to each other right now. What was Kind of interesting about that is it actually allowed us to interact with more airmen than we could have if we were limited to the locations that we were going to. We were able yeah. to hit every single match comp. We were able to get PACOM 
assigned officers, USFK assigned officers, Stratcom. I don't think we got UCOM, but I know we had USAFE. Yeah. And that was really cool. I felt bad, especially the folks in Korea who stayed up until 11 p.m. or woke up at 5 a.m. Or maybe that was why. One of those two, right? They were so excited to be part of these and bring their perspective. And additionally, as we were kind of looking at these measurements, we were also collecting data on, you know, well, tell us about the ALQs. What do you think about them? And as we exited phase two is when we solidified around these 10. Okay. And then began the work of how do we get these out to the field? And how do we continue to gather feedback on them? And so as we were looking at that and talking amongst ourselves, what's the best way to get this out and get this out quickly to the force? Because we, we have a good product here. We validated it. We put it in front of airmen. And they too are saying, yes, this is a good resource. And to your point, Colin, you know, the vast majority of them are like, hey, yeah, I may not like one or two, or I may not like, I may not like five, but I like this product. Yes. I like what you're doing with this. Let's get this out. And that's where the 724A, the addendum to the ACA was born, because here was something that we could release, push out to the service or now to the DAF, to the department and use it as an optional tool. And I know the, probably the most commonly asked question we get is, is, is why'd you make it optional? And what I'll say to that is one of our mantras is first do no harm. And our second <laughs> mantra is we're 100% certain we're not going to get this 100% right. General Kelly yeah. says that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I will shamelessly use that and always give him credit as the originator of that. But that is something that I will carry through with me for the rest of my career is that when you start something, you know, you're not going to get it exactly the way you want it to. So let's make this optional. Let's have people start using it. But then let's also make sure that we're working and we're going to gather this feedback, collect feedback from the field and from various partners throughout the Air Force, and then fine tune them before we start making it a requirement. Yeah. And that was our thought process behind there of why we wanted to make it optional. Because at the end of the day, all of our research was sound and we were confident in our product. But we also knew in the Air Force, if we make something mandatory, it's also sometimes, you know, our service culture is like, what do you mean this is mandatory? But if we make it optional, more people will be inclined to want to try it out and use it. No, absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy that the product exists. You know, as you and I have conversed before, and as Reed and I have said here on the podcast, I don't hate it. I actually think it's quite good. Yes, I have my disagreements with it. And that primary disagreement is the 10 ALQs. I just think there's too many. And I think that of those 10, too many of them are focused on competence as opposed to character which I think is the primary driver of trust, especially for the officer. But that's my own personal opinion. And you there at half A1H can do what you want with that. But I do want to turn it back over to Josh to say, what has been the feedback from the field? What are you doing with that feedback? And what is the future of these ALQs? Today is August 17th that we are recording this. What are we doing for the rest of the year with these ALQs? What can we expect in calendar year 22? Yeah, thanks, Colin. And I'm like you there, especially because I wasn't on the team that, you know, originally formulated it. I got one base visit, the base I happened to be at to talk about it. But yeah, I think in a force of 330,000 active duty, you know, and scale that out a couple hundred thousand more with our total force, you're not going to find consensus across exactly what the words are and exactly how many there are. Certainly not. And so I like the way you talk about it, right? And I always kind of frame things as like, hey, they're not wholly wrong. I think that they're really a great tool. And so thinking about where we want to go with airman leadership qualities is a great question. You said, you know, it's August. So don't quote me on days, but I'll give you kind of the broad overview of where our Air Force leadership wants to see us move with airman leadership quality. First, I'll talk about your first question, though. You know, what are we doing with the feedback? So just like Jim mentioned, you know, our senior leadership, so specifically General Kelly, the Air Force A-1, recognizes that it's valuable to acknowledge upfront and frequently that yes, we're the HR professionals, but we do not know everything about how every single product we're responsible for is being implemented and the best ways to improve it. And so that feedback that we're getting is being integrated into some decisions on what the final verbiage of the ALQs will be. Some of that could be the actual uh, rubric that you see verbiage on the rubric. It could be the ALQs themselves. I don't think you're going to see us come back with 10 completely different ALQs. That's just right. not how getting feedback from the force works is like, oh, we're just going to start over and try again. 
but I certainly believe that we're going to be responsive to the feedback that we're getting. One, I'll tell you my own personal conversations with folks in my network, and you know, it spans the grades. I'll be honest, I haven't talked to a second lieutenant who's used them, but I've talked to lieutenants who've received them, all the way up to colonels and geos who've used them. And the feedback is that they're great, that there is some discussion about how exactly do I frame one of the particular airman leadership qualities. So, you know, everybody doesn't have the same one they kind of cage in on, but yeah. that is generally the feedback is how do I frame that for my particular experience officer? I know we kind of quickly go to rank. When it comes to leadership assessment and characteristics, I tend to really look at it more about experience and demonstration, really, you know, what is the person demonstrating? And so maybe that has to do with rank, particularly when you think the traditional pathway, some people gain experience. But to be specific, I think somebody may ask, and I'll pick one, which could be, you know, stewardship, right? And so I think it's an easy, and I picked that one on purpose, okay. right? Like it's an easy one for folks to kind of get that mind's eye concept of like, well, what does stewardship look like for a lieutenant that has few financial resources directly under their responsibility or authority? And I use that keyword directly yeah. versus maybe a squadron commander who's got, you know, a budget under their authority and probably they're not the ones like directly dispersing it or whatever, but it, they're responsible for it. Right. Sure. And to that response, I would say we need that feedback to keep helping us understand if we've got the right rubric definitions, how we fully roll the ALQs out. And it, this is kind of my segue to the long-term connection of the ALQs is evaluation, right? Right. So how is your performance going to be evaluated on the ALQs? How do we teach and train our force to be able to effectively provide feedback, which is critical for effectively rating performance? Yeah. And so what I anticipate you'll see, again, I said, you, you talked about it's August and I said, don't quote me. So hopefully I gave you a good answer for your first one. For the second question, you know, what I expect all of your listeners will see going into the fall is for us to continue facilitating that feedback. We're, we're actually a couple of days away from pushing out a second Air Force wide survey, okay. which goes out, you know, randomly to Air Force officers and enlisted across and civilians across the force because everybody's using these to provide feedback. If you're a raider of an officer, senior and CO, these are available for you to provide the feedback. And we use that data from the Air Force Survey Office. So if you've got a listener that gets that email and it's from the Air Force Survey Office, please follow through with it. Don't ignore it. And give us, yeah, don't ignore it. Give us the feedback. I know that those are sometimes the ones, you know, you set to the side and you're like, I'll get to that at the end of the day. Just pay attention to the closeout date and get to it before the end of the day on the closeout date. And so, you know, that feedback is likely to keep running through the fall, maybe into the winter timeframe. Looking ahead into 2022, I would expect that our Air Force senior leaders decide on a specific time frame that they want the airman leadership qualities to be the foundation for what feedback looks like in the Air Force right now. It's important that Jim mentioned that these are optional. Yeah. You know, I would expect based off of us talking about wanting to modernize our talent management processes and recognizing that where industry and the American workforce is right now is focusing on skills and attributes and giving feedback in that arena. I wouldn't be surprised if our senior leaders look at this for the entire force, irrespective of your grade. Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's something that is probably reasonable to anticipate in 2022. And for sure, what's reasonable to anticipate is for these to be linked to your evaluation. And so for all of us, regardless of our grade, regardless of our component or service active guard reserve, that our performance will be linked to the airman leadership qualities in some form or fashion, if not in whole. Like our entire performance will be rated against the airman leadership qualities. And yes, it will be, to tie it back to the point I made earlier, it will be relative to the scope of resources you have to be a good steward of. But stewardship you know, ties through no matter what your rank or grade is, because I gave a little foreshadowing to this earlier, right? You can have direct responsibility for things and indirect responsibility for things. And stewardship isn't just to bring that one, you know, out completely. It's not just about money. It's about people, right? You know, those are people are resources as well. 
and people's families are resources and how the decisions that we make affect those other entities. Those could be other ways to look at stewardship, just as an example for an Emerald Leadership Quality. So hopefully that tells you we're taking the feedback. I think we're going to keep, you know, chomping on it as we get through the end of this 2021 into the fall and winter. And then looking into 2022, I expect our senior leaders will make some decisions about the entire force using it or not and when that happens and leading into a time frame for us to look at how all of us get rated against the Airman Leadership Quality. Okay. So we can eventually expect the release of the new OPR that we've been hearing about for decades. That's eventually going to happen. Maybe not in 22, maybe sometime in the next mm, 10 years, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, you said decades. So yeah, no, you're not wrong. I think that as our senior leaders decide the time frame that's right for the force to release a new officer evaluation system and enlisted evaluation system, it's going to have many, if not all, of the components of the Airman leadership qualities, just because of the reason we're saying. They may not look like exactly the 10 copy-paste, you know, dump them over to the new system that we know is not going to, you know, be based off PDF forms, but it's going to be an actual interface that you work with. But at the same time, you know, the ALQs will be a large component of that. And I think probably, you know, to share thoughts with your listeners, our senior leaders are keenly aware of two things. First, Jim talked about do no harm. And so a good representation of that is that you don't rate somebody something that you didn't give them feedback and an opportunity mm -hmm. to change their you know, behavior on. And so the timing is going to be kept in mind there. And it's also going to be ample for everybody to make the change. And then secondarily, you know, I'm fond of saying, I talked about this earlier when we talked about the force support community. We are combat support and mission support professionals. Everybody in the Air Force's job is not to do feedback and evaluations. It is critically important that we do it well mm -hmm. because it's about taking care of people, but doing feedback and evaluations and learning systems cannot consume, you know, eight hours of your duty day because then right. you don't have time to focus on the mission. And so when you think about the changes our senior leaders are weighing and the timing that they elect to do those, I think that'll be another thing that's really important in terms of the decision that they make is how it'll affect the force and the tempo for everybody to adapt to the change. Yeah, absolutely. And that has been historically the problem with all of the feedback and the evaluation tools that the Air Force has used is that one, people are busy. And so they don't feel like they can take the time to give feedback the justice that it deserves. Two, they don't really understand the tool. And three, they don't see the connection between the feedback they receive and the performance that they hope to attain. So if we can get after those issues, then I think that there is a possibility for this to be successful. But again, people have to use it. It doesn't matter if it is the 100% perfect solution. If people don't use it, it doesn't matter. So Jim, you quoted General Kelly. We all know that it's not perfect. We are 100% certain it is not 100% correct, right? But we're not going to be able to iterate on it and have it start to become better, get closer to that better solution unless people are using it, unless they answer that survey that they're going to receive here in the next couple of weeks or something. They have to provide that feedback to half, to each other, in order for this system, whatever it ends up looking like for the feedback, for the evaluations, that's the only way that this is going to work. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the key components that we've talked about throughout our discussion on ALQs is about what we value as a force, Yeah. right? And I mentioned that our senior leaders set us on a path for that some years ago, and we're, we're moving along on that path really well. But it's coming back to the reality that we can profess to value these, but if we're not using them as a force and we're not providing not just feedback to our rate e, but feedback to the institution about whether these are right or not, then we're not going to get to that best product like you talked about. And I'm sure that Jim's got a comment on that too, but I, I jumped in before he could. Go ahead, Jim. Well, so what Colonel Hawkins said is spot on. And the only thing that I would add back to Colin on your point on feedback and not just providing feedback to the half and to our team on how to make the ALQs better, but when we just talk about feedback in general, performance feedback. Now is the time to start having those uncomfortable conversations of you're developing here or you're proficient here. You're not all the way to the right here. 
because there are no career consequences, right? In the sense of people are so afraid to give markdowns because they're worried about hurting someone's chances for promotion. This is an optional form that does not go into anybody's record. So now is the best time for the rate tees out there. Go to your rater and say, no, mark me down where you think I need to work the most. And as the raters have those conversations, you know, I like to say that when we would wrap up our focus groups, I'd always say to all the participants, like, hey, feedback is a gift, even if you don't like the wrapping paper it came in. So like, let us hear it, right? And they would just, you know, give us their honest assessments of things, right, at times. But really in life and in work, it's the same thing that as a service, I think we struggle in giving feedback, but I will also 100% say we struggle in receiving feedback. And this is the time to start having those conversations and start getting comfortable with it, start getting better with it. Receive that feedback, process it, pull it out for the nuggets of truth that are in there and go, or may, hey, maybe I don't agree with that, but that's what my boss is saying that they're seeing. So I maybe have to make sure that what they're seeing of me is where I actually think I'm at, that I think that I'm outstanding at, you know, at stewardship, but they're not seeing that. So I can now take steps to work towards showing that to them in an environment where it's an optional tool, in an environment where it's not going to go into your permanent record. Now is the best opportunity to start getting comfortable with these kinds of conversations as both the rater and the rate And if the listeners take away anything, I hope they take away a lot. But if they only take away one thing, it's start having those conversations now. We're in that trial period, right? We're testing these things out. Man, I cannot agree more. I hope that people let that sink in that this is the perfect opportunity for these conversations to take place. You know, the Chinese proverb goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Like we could have gotten this right ages ago, but we didn't, right? Now we have the opportunity to try to get better. But we each have to take that responsibility on ourselves as CGOs, as NCOs, as FGOs, regardless of where you are in your development, seek feedback, provide feedback, and seek to use the tools that the Air Force has provided so that we can iterate on it and have them become better just like we want to become better. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating discussion. I have learned so much, not just on the ALQs, also from your experience as force support officers, also from your perspective, sitting there at half A1H and bringing the strategic vision from our senior leaders to this podcast, to our audience. Thank you so much for taking the time to share all of this with us. Now that we are at this point, if anybody wants to provide more pointed feedback beyond the survey that they're going to receive here in a couple of weeks. If they have something that they want to send directly to you, Jim, directly to you, Josh, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Or again, it doesn't have to be about ALQs. It could be about being a force support officer. If there is anything that they want to get in touch with you, how is the best way to do that, Jim? So uh, for me, it's probably through the global on email. They can shoot me a note. I will say if it's feedback for the ALQs, I will happily talk with them. And then I'm going to forward it to the A1H team since I'm starting my job at Andrews. And it's not that I suddenly stopped being passionate about it, but you know, I'm out there at the mission level doing what force support officers do best. And so I'm going to hand it off to the team that does the other thing that force support officers do best which is at that Air Force-wide policy level. Excellent. But please, I'm the only James Nardelli in the Air Force in the global. There's some army guy who keeps beating me to every promotion. And like we've been in so many of the same locations, like one year apart, and he keeps getting emails. He never forwards them to me. So if you- Have you met him yet? I haven't. Send him an email and say, hey, bro, we're going to meet up and have a throwdown to decide who is the true James Nardelli. And the best part is, is he goes by Jim as well. And it's Jim in the global. Perfect. And so he's gotten many an email on my behalf. So in the global, I'm the only Air Force James Nardelli. Excellent. Yeah. It sounds like you guys need to have a battle of Josh's out there or something, Jim. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, I know something about that. No, I'm the same way as Jim. You know, the global is great. I'm the only... Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Hawkins, my brother routinely gets emails and I routinely get emails for him, but you know, we email them to each other because he's Colonel Ronnie Hawkins, but you know, that's a great way. And then my vector, you know, for sure, any folks who have got career questions sitting out there on the, my vector, a mentoring platform. So you can look me up through the, my vector platform as well. Happy to engage through either mediums. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. 
All right. So you've had a couple of episodes to think through it, Colonel Hawkins. The time is now. The audience wants to hear what does it mean to be an officer? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Colin. Yeah. I'm a little bit more of a, an old school thought process on it. You know, I appreciate one of your episodes where you talked about the commission. So, you know, I think that that ultimately is where I'd start. You know, the commission to me is for each of us as officers, irrespective of our branch of service, it represents authority that is vested from the president through several echelons, sometimes many echelons, depending on what your rank is, down to you to represent that commander in chief or command authority to your formation, whatever that formation may be. It may be one person you're leading on a team, it may be a squadron, it may be a group, a wing, it may be the whole Air Force, right? And so I start there, but I don't end there. Where I really take it from my experience is, I already alluded to it as team. An officer is a part of a team. There are instances where they are the leader of the team. They've been designated by virtue of their commission to be the leader of the team. That isn't all we are though. We're teammates, we're followers, we are people who recognize our responsibility and the authority we've got to develop both people and the mission are two things that I think about a lot. And so when I think about you know the commission and what it means to be a commissioned officer, I think about the authority and the responsibility, but I recognize that you know that's, I don't wanna say it's something that you switch on and off, but it's not something that is constant. Your time in authority and leadership will come and go but your role as a team member is always there. Yeah. And so those are the big things that I think of and look for both holding myself accountable to and look for other officers uh, to be demonstrating as well. Absolutely. Love it so much. Thank you both gentlemen. This has been very instructive. Again, I hope that the audience will allow the wisdom, the experience, and the, the passion that has been shared here to, to become part of them, to encourage them to be better themselves to provide that feedback to you, to others, and ultimately just try to make our Air Force and our officer corps as good as it possibly can be because the American people deserve it, our airmen deserve it, and I could not be more honored to be part of this team, as you mentioned there, Josh, because, man, our Air Force is not perfect, but it is great. Anything else that either of you want to share before we turn off the mics here? Just thanks so much for having us. This has been great. Yeah, I would echo, you know, thanks for giving us the opportunity to connect with your audience and look forward to hearing from them and continuing to hear the discussions that you're leading. So thanks for the work you're doing too. Thank you very much. All right, Reed, we have had a lot of information brought to us by Jim and Josh about the force support career field, how they get involved in the personnel, the career development, the acquisition of talent, the retention of talent. We've heard a lot from them and where the Air Force is going with this. But they also mentioned that this is where industry as a whole is going. I just want to address that a little bit because I'm now seeing those things in my new career. Yes, I'm still in the Air Force, but in the reserve, do it part-time. So my full-time job is out in the industry that they mentioned. And what we are seeing is that so much of what's going on right now, especially with the post-COVID world, the resetting of how industry does business with remote work, the flexibility of schedules, those kinds of things that if the talented people have the option of going someplace else, then they're probably going to do that. And so this whole discussion about what 38 Foxtrots do and now these airmen leadership qualities is all about making sure that when we meet those Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we addressed last week, and we reach that pinnacle of the hierarchy, which is self-actualization, people are going to go where they can find self-actualization, where they're able to do that. Ask yourself, why do people want to come into the Air Force and then why do they stay? It's because they see an opportunity to have their needs met and then participate in self-actualization. And we're seeing this in the Air Force. We're seeing this in industry. If we don't get this right, those talented people will leave the Air Force. They already are. 
but they're going to do it in greater numbers as soon as the pandemic is over and the economy starts growing again. We're going to see this happen. And so the Air Force has to get this right now. Yeah. And like you said, this is a small part of a much bigger trend. Almost entirely gone are the days where you were born in a town, you worked at the local factory for the next 40 years, and then so did your children. Like that era has passed Yeah, almost entirely. There are still remnants and it still exists. Well, and the military is kind of like the last bastion of that type of thing. Exactly. And that's exactly where I was headed, right? Is it was only a few years ago that our 20 year retirement changed significantly. Now, that is a component of the blended retirement system, but overwhelmingly, the intent of that system is to allow people to be more mobile, Mm -hmm. to leave earlier with something. That was the intent of the blended retirement system. So no longer is it all or nothing at 20 years. That carrot is gone. Yeah. And as more of us who are in that all or nothing 20 year system leave once we hit that 20 years or we just leave for whatever other reasons, the entire perspective of a military career has to change. People aren't talking about it very much, but you're starting to hear the whispers that we're going to hit this like manpower cliff. Yeah. You know, this convergence of all of these topics, these issues are coming to a head. And this feedback idea is so important in order to keep us equipped with the right talent that will be required to be successful in our future endeavors. Yeah. Because feedback is what helps people know that they are fulfilling that self-actualization piece of it and some of the lower levels too. Yep. And also where they need to improve in order to get that self-actualization. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just wandering around in the dark. Yeah. Ultimately, the discussion around the ALQs and this idea of feedback is that the ALQs and feedback just in general is a retention tool for the Air Force. And we mentioned it in the interview that historically, we have not done well at feedback. It didn't matter what the tool was, whether it was a performance worksheet or some sort of assessment, your initial midterm, final evaluation in the form of an OPR, eventually the most recent change, the ACA addendum. It doesn't matter what the tool is if people don't use it and provide feedback on the feedback tool. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It 100% does. And I wanted to point out a recent experience that I've had using the addendum, using these ALQs to help me, help my boss stratify officers. It should be no mystery to anybody who's been in a leadership position before that part of your role is to identify and push the people who are performing well and then to help lead the airmen who are struggling and get them to improve so that they can be successful, self-actualized. Yeah. So two things that happened recently. I did initial feedback for the airmen I'm rating, and I used the addendum. I said, this is how I will evaluate you. Most of them had never seen it. Okay. So that's one thing of note. You know, so feedback to Major Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins. Most of these folks, all officers, had not seen this document before. The next experience I wanted to share is when I was helping my boss to do this, to help him stratify officers, I used the ALQs and I found it incredibly powerful. It helped Mm. me to get things that were squishy, soft, hard to define and get it down on paper objectively. Yeah. You know, let's just use innovation. It's one of the major performance areas. I looked at it. I read the definition right on the document. And then I read where developing is, okay? And then I read performing. And then I went through the chain and I said, okay, this is where this person is relative to this major performance area and why. And so it took it out of that, oh yeah, they're great. You know, good job, keep it up into, you are innovating and here's how I've seen that, but here's what is keeping you out of that highest category. Let's focus there. And I found it incredibly powerful. Yeah, And so my plea to the audience is twofold. Use it and then provide feedback. Just give it a shot. Yeah. Yes, we can shake our fists at the sky and like, oh, everyone's going to become, you know, firewall fives. It's not going to work. It's going to be inflated. Just give it an honest try. 
it might surprise you. It certainly surprises me. I've been excited about it. Yeah. I haven't been supervising people in my previous position. So this was an opportunity for me to really, you know, jump in. I've been pleasantly surprised. Yeah. And again, the tool is not perfect, right? Agreed. You have now used it and you see some of those imperfections, but despite the imperfections, despite some of those shortcomings, it's still good. Like you and I both feel like there are things that need to change about it. And we've talked about those previously. We think that there are too many ALQs. Let's consolidate some of them and let's bring in a greater focus on character. But even so, having something to use to help us get better at feedback is an excellent thing. And if we don't use it, we're not going to improve. It doesn't have to be the ACA addendum. There are plenty of wonderful feedback tools out there in the business world. You know, so many different books about how to give feedback, when to do it, you know, setting the tone and all of those things. But this is the one that the Air Force has provided us and they are asking for feedback on our ability to give feedback, right? So the last thing that I want to say about this, Reed, is that feedback is a gift. We heard Jim say that in the interview. I've heard that phrase elsewhere. It is. Feedback is a gift in that it is something that you, as the person who is giving the feedback, you have value placed on this feedback, and you hope that the person that you are giving it to will also value it, hence a gift. But you know what? Tact is also a gift. And that's one of the things that I'm afraid of with the ACA is because it makes things more concrete, more objective, it removes some of the difficulty, the friction, that people will just point to the paper and say, this is where you are, fix it. And thereby we lose some of the relationship, the bonding that must take place if we want to develop the connection that's needed for ultimate mission success. And so tact is also a gift. And when you provide the feedback to another person, as well as the feedback to half A1H on the ACA addendum and these ALQs, express a little tact, right? Don't just completely tear it apart. Say where things are good. Say where things need improvement. And give that gift as best as you can so that we can all improve together. Yeah. You know, and on your point to, again, really support this document, I want people to use it. The people who are good at giving feedback previously are going to be better with the ACA. Mm -hmm. The people who didn't give feedback or who were crap at giving feedback, at the very minimum, if they actually filled this out. And are honest about it. Yeah, you have something. So this is in every measurable way better than the blank boxes where people just wrote stuff. So, yeah. but at the same time, it's not perfect. I definitely have a couple of things, you know, I'm still trying to put them down in words you know, some things I think we can improve on. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about that in the future, but use it, give feedback. I'm excited about where this is pointing. And I told this to my boss the other day, I said, it gives me incredible pride and confidence that the people who the system worked for are working to make the system better. I think that takes an incredible amount of humility. Mm. It makes me excited about being an airman. I think that's a great place to leave it, Reed. I agree. We'll wrap it up this week. Again, major, major gratitude and expressions of thanks to Major Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins for joining us on these last two weeks. Immeasurable amounts of knowledge that they dropped. I'm so grateful. I learned a ton. Hopefully you did as well. And that'll do it. And thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commissionette.